So, we've been talking about the big questions. Can you remember some of the big questions we've been asking so far? Who is the church? Who is the church? was last week, yeah. What were some of the other big questions? Remember the first, what, with the one question we asked to talk about getting stuck. Why do people get stuck? Um, what's that? What is the church? Yep. Yeah. Can God be trusted? Um, these are questions that, that people have. Um, am I here by accident or am I here on purpose? Um, we've been asking a lot of these questions. Um, and so the question, the one big question we have today, and this question is so big it's going to take us two weeks to get it done. Um, but I think it's kind of appropriate the way it works out. Um, is how will it all end? People want to know. How will it all end? end. Will the earth just go up in a big puff of smoke and that's it? Is there anything beyond this life? When they put us in that box and they bury us six foot under, is there anything beyond that? Are heaven and hell real? That's what we're going to look at over the next two Sundays. Um, I initially had it all in one message. I'm like, we're going to go 45 minutes and we got, we got the ecumenical home this afternoon. No, don't want to do that. Um, when we started this series, we looked at our origins. How did we get here? Am I an accident or am I, uh, am I here on purpose? And we said that part of the problem with figuring out our origins is that none of us were here. Well, when it comes to how it all will end, we have a very similar problem. We're not there yet. And so it's tough to figure out what the future holds because we're not there. Now, there, there have been movies, there's been books written, made about how the world will end. There is the movie that scared me to death as an eight-year-old. The one on the left, A Thief in the Night. How many of you remember that from way back in the day? Scared me to death. <sighs> Youth camp was never the same. Um... Then there's the whole Nicolas Cage and the Left Behind series. Um, and both of these movies and books that were written initially are based on a particular interpretation of how the end will happen. Um, there are all kinds of words. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put up just a few of the words that can be used to describe the end times. And here they come. Pre-trib, post-millennial, post-trib, mid-trib. Premillennial, amillennial, <laughs> rapture, and people and people get all bent out of shape about these. Like, well, if you're not this, then then you're not a believer. Or if you're not this, you're not a believer. I'm what's called a pan millennial. It will all pan out in the end, and that's the direction we're going to go with this message this morning. There are people have written books. I've I've seen charts that would take up the entire front wall with how it's all going to end. And we could really get caught up in the weeds here. We could really get stuck. Wondering how it would all end. It's tempting to mash up scripture to know how it all end. There, there are people who are really good at this. They'll take a little bit of Ezekiel, a little bit of Daniel, a little bit of Isaiah, mix it in with some of the words of Jesus, and then take some of the writings of Paul, and then put in a big mixing bowl and mix it up all with Revelation. And say, this is exactly how Jesus is going to come back. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. We, we, for one, we need to be careful when we mix Old Testament prophecies, because those were written for Israel for the most part, with the apocalyptic book of Revelation, because that was written to... It, there, there's definitely stuff in there for, for us, um, but it was primarily written to the first century church. And so... We, we, we got to just really watch. And then Jesus has some words about how it's all going to end. But we're not going to worry about that too much today. We're, we're not going to worry about all the details. We want to get the big picture of how it will all end. But we need to go back and just quickly review. Genesis. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. God and righteous people in paradise. We learn how it all began. We know that... God created the, the heavens and the earth. God created Adam and Eve. 
And just about as soon as he created Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, we have sin and Satan enter the world and Satan deceived Adam and Eve and they ate and God said, what did you do? And so he banished them and they started having a family and in a couple of generations, we don't know how long it was between the banishment and, the, and Noah, but they had gotten so bad that God said, you know what? I'm just going to start over. And so he found one righteous man his name was Noah, one righteous man in chapter 6 of Genesis and says, I'm going to, I'm, I've judged the world, it is found wanting, and I'm going to destroy it. And so he does. We have the flood. Then just after Noah's general, you, you would think, I mean, come on. We're, we're talking about the first eight chapters of Genesis. Already, God, we have got it in our mind that, oh, we're better than God. And every time we think we're better than God, it's Boom. And so, one world government, they said, let's build a tower. Let's build a big skyscraper all the way to God because we can do that because we're better than God. God foils the plan of men once again. And then finally, in chapter 15 of Genesis, we learn about Abraham. And we heard about the covenant that he had with his people. And all the way from Genesis chapter 15, all the way through the book of Malachi, we hear the story of God and his people. Did they have their act together? No. Do we have our act together? No. Um, I sure wish we did. I wish, I wish we had our act together. But we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so we end up with the Tower of... Uh, so, so the Old Covenant, and then... I'm, I, I skipped ahead of you. I'm sorry. Um, then we have, at the very pinnacle, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came in to fix us. He came to save us because we weren't able of following the laws on our own. He had to come and save us. And then we had the new covenant from all the way from Acts all the way through Jude. Um, we, we hear about the new covenant. Jesus came to save us from our sins. That he died on the cross. And we were told how we should live. We, we asked the questions, why, why aren't Christians different from anybody else? And why do we need the church? But then we get to this. The one world government. The the, the, the mirror image to the Tower of Babel. And you've heard the theories of what consists of the one world government. I mean, I know there were Christians when, when they first started talking about the League of Nations. Oh, it's the one world government. Or even the United Nations or NATO. Or I remember when I was little, back, back in the days of A Thief in the Night, there was the talk of the European common market, the ten nations that were going to gather. And that was the one world government that was talked about. In, in Revelation, or now we, the common market has now become the European Union. And all of these have been suggested as the one world government described in Revelation. And are these the organizations that part of the one world government? I don't know. They could be. Sometimes I'm going to have a lot more questions. I really feel like I am not an apocalyptic preacher. I am not good at preaching prophecy. But I know what the word says. And that's what we're going to look at today, today is what the Word says. Uh, we're not going to get caught up in the weeds. When the Bible was written, think about this. When the Bible was written, there was no such thing as one world government. There was, it, took, it took weeks to get a letter somewhere. Now if I send you an email and you read it, um, it can be there instantaneously. Um, if I send you a text, you can have that immediately. Um, the, the Bible didn't even understand some of the, the technology that we have available to us now. And, you know, because there was, you know, what there, there was the Roman Empire. Did the Roman Empire cover the entire world? No. Did Constantine's Empire cover the whole world? No. Did Napoleon's Empire cover the whole world? No. And so, you know, up until the current time, up until right now, it's, it was almost impossible to imagine a single world government. But the European Union now has a single form of currency, the euro. And it is possible to conceive of a time, and we're, we're getting there now, that there will be a single currency, especially as we move more and more to a cashless society. And so it's really hard to determine what the timeline is and... There is one event, 
you know, whether, how, however you want to work this timeline, because pe different people say different things, but there is one event, and I believe, my, my personal feeling here about the book of Revelation is, that all of Revelation has been fulfilled, except for the return of Jesus. So that is the next big event on God's calendar, is the return of Jesus. Yeah. And then the things that happen right after that, I mean, that's like chapter 19. So the only thing remaining in the Bible to be fulfilled yet is chapters 19, 20, and 21, and 22. That's it. Um, but I do believe that Jesus' return is the next thing on God's calendar. And it will, it will change the course of history. There is no doubt about that. Paul writes in to the church in Thessalonica, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First the believers who have died will rise from their grave, then together with them we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There we will be with the Lord forever. What Paul is describing here is what we often hear known as the rapture. It is, here in Thessalonians, is the only place that that word is mentioned. Um, it, it happens in Thessalonians, and it's that word that means to be caught up, rapture, to be caught up. And Paul is describing the second coming of Jesus, and as I mentioned earlier, there is much discussion and disagreement as to how all this will happen, but the book of Revelation makes it clear that it will happen. When Jesus came to earth the first time as an infant, setting aside his divinity, his godly glory, to take on human flesh, the second time he comes back, we will see him in all of his glory. This time the angels won't be singing in the distance to the shepherds in a field, but they will be on horses and they will follow him down. Listen to how John describes it in chapter 19. Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dripped or dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses, and from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. And on his robe at his side was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Some may argue, church, you've been talking about the return of Jesus for 2,000 years, for two millennia. And it's true, we have. And I think the church's passion for Jesus coming back tends to wax and wane. Um, growing up as a child, and, and I think really it was the last time that we heard a lot about the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Um, I remember, you know, films like Thief in the Night. Um, and, but I remember songs like Andre Crouch, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king, or Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. They were, they were popular, that's, that's what they were playing. Um, Christian music artists like Larry Norman in Second Chapter of Acts and Love Song evangelized at their concert because they thought Jesus was coming back that very week. Wow, what if we evangelized like Jesus was coming back today? The days are short. In many ways, the days that we are living in are much like the days of Noah. People were going about their ordinary lives. God judged the people and found them wanting. During the days of Noah, God sent a mighty flood, and the world was judged and destroyed. But there's coming a day, Peter talks about this. More importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking the truth and following their own desires. 
And they will say, what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again? From the four of the times of our ancestors, everything has remained the same since the world was first created. They deliberately forgot that God made the heavens long ago by his word of his command, and he brought the earth from out of the water and surrounded it with water, and then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood, and at the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment, Then ungod when ungodly people will be destroyed. You must not forget this one thing. Church, you must not forget this one thing. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No. He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. The first time that Jesus came, we're getting ready to celebrate that here in a few weeks, aren't we? He came as a carpenter. The second time he came, he will come as the king of kings. The first time he came, he stood before Pilate. The next time he comes, Pilate's going to stand before him. And when he comes back, the stage will be set for the next big event. The mirror image of Noah and the flood. The world will be judged and it will be destroyed. There is coming a day when saint and sinner will be judged and everything will be laid bare. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. This is a sobering thought this morning. Because it doesn't say just the sinners will be judged. But the saints will be judged as well. When he comes again to judge the earth, nothing will be secret. That should strike the fear in us. Everything we have ever done, everything that we tried to hide from God, Everything we have ever done, everything we have ever done will be out in the open and he will judge us. Peter said, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. When we live holy and godly lives, we push the day of judgment along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in the flames, but we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. But let us not forget the judgment. <coughs> yes, we can talk a lot about, and we sing songs of when, when we all get to heaven, what a, what a day of rejoicing that will be. For the day of rejoicing, there is a day of judgment. Kevin Myers tells a story of how a friend of his owns a Fiari 488 Spider. I don't know what that car is. I had to look up what it is. And, and so apparently that's a Fiari 488 Spider. It's fast. In 2.8 seconds, you can go from 0 to 60. Yeah. And, and Kevin, who is the pastor at 12 Stone Church has a friend who has one. And he said to Kevin, Kevin, why don't you go take this car out for a drive and have some fun? Well, Kevin did. And he was amazed. Taking it from 0 to 60 in 2.8 seconds. Imagine. 1, 2, 3. Can you imagine? 0 to 60 in 3 seconds. Kevin was amazed by the car. and then, But here's what's really cool. Might not have been cool to Kevin when he got it. Several days later, his friend sent him a text with a picture summary 
of Kevin's entire drive. It had an entire digital summary of everything, including how fast he drove it. Kevin had no idea there was a computer on board recording his every move. Well, guess what? When it comes to our lives, both sinners and saints, there is a computer in God's heaven that is recording every single move. All of us will face the judgment. Nothing will be overlooked. And I think we're going to be surprised at all the things that we did in secret that were never a secret to God. It's really sobering when I think about it myself. Solomon writes this, Now here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. The day is coming. No one, no one, no one. Not you, not your pastor, not our DS, not our general superintendent, not a bishop, not a cardinal, not a pope, no matter who you are, you will not escape God's judgment. It doesn't matter who you are. Everything on earth will be judged against God's holy standard. And I think all we can say is, Lord, have mercy. Yes. All have sinned. All fall short of God's glorious standard. That's some pretty bad news. We can't measure up against Christ, God's standard. No one can measure up, not even the Pope. Guess what? Even you and I deserve God's condemnation. Except there's a couple verses I want to share with you before we go. Because here's what Paul says. For the wages of sin is death. Guess what? That's you and me. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The bad news is that the best person you know, the most moral person, the most saintly person you know is a sinner deserving of death except by God's grace by which we stand. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. The bad news is that we are sinners. To paraphrase Jonathan Edwards, we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. But by his grace, that sent Jesus to die for us on the cross and rise again on the third day, we can be saved. good news. The bad news is that we're dead. We are dead in our sins. We are caught. But the good news is that if we accept God as our judge, if we plead guilty by the confession of our sins, if we seek the forgiveness through Jesus Christ, we will be spared. And because he forgave us, our names are written in the Lamb's book. So as we close, I want to give you an opportunity to receive God's free gift. 
Last night I found a wonderful song that tells the story of God's wonderful mystery. It really is a mystery when you think about it. When you think about that the God of the universe who created everything loved us enough that he created us, and even though we weren't capable of following his holy law, he sent Jesus to die for us and rise again for us. And then 50 days later, after rising again, 40 days later, he went to heaven and he's been preparing a place for us for 2,000 years. What kind of grace is that but amazing? The song tells the wonderful story of God's mystery in Jesus coming to earth to save us even though we didn't deserve it. But this morning, as we close, the altar is open. Pastor Pam and I are available. Jesus is willing to forgive. All we have to do is ask. Mm -hmm.